system uh, responds to physical um, uh, information from the environment and uh, the physical dimensions in the auditory system have parallels in the uh, visual system. Uh, the analog to uh, brightness in the visual system is amplitude or intensity. The analog to hue or color uh, is frequency of uh, tone. And uh, the analog to saturation is complexity uh, or uh, timber, for example. And uh, essentially, air pressure changes uh, cause the eardrum <coughs> to vibrate. Um, there's this rarefied negative pressure in the air that gets compressed as it enters the uh, open, opening of the ear. And uh, then that causes the eardrum to vibrate. So these vibrations are then transmitted um, to uh, the inner ear via three small bones, or uh, ossicles as they're called. Um, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes um, or more colloquially known uh, for their English translations from the Latin is hammer, uh, anvil, and stirrup. And <coughs> the stirrup, one of the ossicles, acts on the fluid in the uh, inner ear like a tiny piston, and it drives the fluid back and forth to the rhythm of the sound waves. And that uh, the sound waves and those waves get processed uh, through changes in the uh, fluid within the cochlea. And then this is the cochlea and with the uh, vestibular um, organs uh, kind of attached to it. And if we unwound the cochlea, as you see here, uh, the movements of the fluid uh, within the cochlea cause the thin membrane uh, on the uh, kind of undersurface, the basilar membrane, to start to resonate. And uh, this movement of the basilar membrane causes movements of the auditory uh, hair receptors, which are seen here. Uh, these are uh, hair cells in what's called the organ of Corti, uh, kind of right in the very center of the cylinder forming the cochlea. And uh, these hair cells um, the membrane potentials are altered in response to movements of the basilar membrane, and that results in the generation of graded potentials and action potentials. And interestingly, it's the structure of the cochlea and the basilar membrane that allow the hair cells to code different frequencies of sound. And in particular, the basilar membrane is very taut and narrow during, near the ossicles, and then the membrane actually becomes wider and floppier toward the far end of the, um, in the cochlea, uh, the, near the apex. And uh, Hermann van Helmholtz, back in the 19th century, was the first to propose that different parts of the basilar membrane resonate with different frequencies of sound. And uh, it's that uh, resonance of the basilar membrane according to certain frequencies of sound that uh, allow us to um, perceive um, different frequencies. Uh, and uh, although his formulation wasn't precisely correct, it was around 1960 that George von Bekesey was able to actually observe directly the fluctuations and movement of the basilar membrane, uh, showing that there's a traveling wave that moves along the surface of the membrane starting at the oval window. And uh, the peak of the wave on the basilar membrane varies in accordance with the frequency of the sound, with higher frequencies causing more peaks near the base of the basilar membrane, lower frequencies causing maximum peaks near the apex. So again, the, the basilar membrane uh, seems to be tuned to different frequencies. Now, as in the visual system, the, hair, uh, the receptor cells, the hair receptor cells, each have their own receptive field. Um, and uh, each of the uh, cells have uh, receptive fields uh, in the, uh, there's also uh, uh, receptive fields in the higher auditory centers as well, up in, in the cortex, as you get deeper and deeper and further along in the processing. So the receptive field um, of a, hair cell in the auditory system isn't really a point in space like the visual system is, but it's a particular frequency of sound. 
So we can call the, the receptor um, or the receptive fields, um, the collective receptive fields in the visual system, retinotopic maps. That is, there's a point-to-point -point relationship between every receptor in the eye and a corresponding part of the brain. Um, and so uh, in contrast with this retinotopic map concept in the visual system, in the auditory system, we say that the receptive field maps are composed of tonotopic maps, the maps um, in response to specific sounds. So um, the uh, axons of the hair cells, they um, leave the cochlea and they form actually uh, the major part of the um, cranial nerve, the eighth cranial nerve. And the nerve first projects to the medulla in the lower brain stem. And so it's synapse in e synapses in either the dorsal or the ventral cochlear nuclei, uh, or the auditory nerve projects to the superior olivary nucleus. And uh, the axons of these cells in these areas form what's called the lateral lemniscus. This lateral lemniscus terminates in specific zones of the inferior colliculus. Remember, the superior colliculus is more associated with the visual system and sort of orienting toward um, sudden uh, flashes of light or sudden movements. The uh, inferior colliculus is um, associated with the auditory system and again associated with our orienting toward particular sounds in the environment that are frightening. So uh, again, as with the visual system, we have two distinct pathways that uh, emerge from the inferior colliculus. Um, and uh, they course to the ventral and dorsomedial geniculate bodies in the thalamus, respectively. Um, in the uh, visual system, the area of the thalamus was called the lateral geniculate body, but in the auditory system, the sensory processing station in the thalamus involves the medial geniculate body. So the um, ventral region, uh, the ventral pathway projects to the primary auditory cortex and the dorsal region projects to the secondary auditory cortex. And this organization uh, then sort of corresponds to um, the general pattern of multiple independent ascending pathways to the cortex. Uh, in most of the sensory systems, we have multiple pathways from the input uh, or the receptor side to the brain, some part of the brain. Um, and uh, this is, uh, again, another uh, uh, image of the um, uh, auditory areas in the human. Um, I am afraid, again, that uh, this image did not come through as it should have. So I'll have to send that out another time. Not sure what's going on with that. Anyway, this is just another view of the, um, uh, the organ of Corti um, right here with the hair cells and the basilar membranes that comprise the organ of Corti. And then we have the cross section of the cochlea um, that uh, has in this image been unwound and looks like a snail shell. Um, you have one on for either ear. Um, so in contrast to the visual system, the projections of the auditory system have both ipsilateral or same-sided um, input and contralateral or other-sided input. Um, so uh, there's actually bilateral representation of each cochlear nucleus in the cortex. Uh, the majority of the auditory input is contralateral though, and uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a technique called dichotic listening that you might have talked about in brain and behavior where uh, that involves uh, wearing headphones and a certain stimulus will be given to one side of the brain, say the, or, um, or one, one ear rather, say the right ear. And that's uh, processed by both hemispheres, but mostly by the left 
hemisphere. There is an ipsilateral input, though. Yeah. So then, is that often for somebody who suffered a stroke and that particular brain region to lose hearing in the opposite side of their body? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's possible. Mm -hmm. okay. So there are several um, auditory areas in the cortex, um, and um, we see evidence for projections from the medial geniculate body to project to independent tonotopically organized cortical zones. That is, they're uh, specifically tuned to uh, specific frequency ranges. And these zones include the core auditory cortex, or Keschel's gyrus. Uh, we call that Brodmann area 41 or 42. And then there's at least seven other zones surrounding it that are responsible for ton the tonotopic organization. Uh, the auditory cortex is normally thought of as being in the temporal lobe, but it actually includes a little bit of the parietal cortex. Um, it uh, includes a region called the parietal operculum and the inferior parietal cortex. So in terms of the properties of the cells in the auditory system, it's pretty interesting that uh, single neurons in the auditory system are responsible for coding the frequency, the specific frequency or pitch of sounds. And different neurons are maximally sensitive to uh, different sound frequencies. And as it turns out, the cells in the subcortical nuclei, like the cochlear nucleus, are responsible, or responsive rather, to a broader range of frequencies than our cells higher in the system uh, in the auditory cortex itself. So for example, a neuron in the cochlear nucleus might have a tuning curve that has a maximal response at 7,000 hertz, but it might be partially sensitive to as low as 1,000 hertz or as high as 12,000 hertz. That's a pretty broad frequency range. And we contrast that with a neuron in the primary auditory cortex that uh, might also have a tuning curve with the same maximum sensitivity of 7,000 hertz but it's only responsive to frequencies between 5,000 and 9,000 hertz. So uh, again, I think that's an important principle that um, more upstream, uh, closer to the stimulus, um, uh, and closer to the receptors, the cells are responsive, they have a much broader tuning curve and are more respon or responsive to a broader range of frequencies. Um, <clears throat> briefly, uh, the vestibular system is kind of integrated in the um, inner ear area, and uh, we have these semicircular canals, as you see, that are sort of organized um, uh, in a vertical and horizontal position, um, and uh, the, tells, the vestibular system itself tells the position of the body relative to gravity. So it's really the function of gravity to uh, uh, help the semicircular canals operate. They, uh, s changes in the fluid within the, vest uh, in the semicircular canals uh, will signal changes in the direction and speed of movements. So they'll signal to you what, how fast you're going, whether you change direction, things of that nature. And uh, they're also involved in helping us ignore destabilizing influences of our movements. So as you're walking along very quickly, the visual horizon is changing quite a bit. And so the vestibular system tells your visual system to, um, to not worry about it, that it's, it's, um, you don't pay as much attention to the, the changes in, um, as you're walking, or walking along or the movement up and down with each of your steps. Um, they're almost imperceptible for most people, thanks to the vestibular system. Now moving to the taste and the smell receptors, um, rather than physical energy like in the auditory and uh, visual system, uh, the stimuli for taste and smell are actually chemical. And there are specialized receptors that are uh, in each of these two subsystems. Uh, the tape for taste, the receptors are the taste buds on the tongue, and uh, we perceive a particular taste from uh, 
the uh, combination or the pattern of firing of those receptors in a particular population in response to a chemical stimulus. Interestingly, the thresholds for taste differ quite a bit. Um, as we get older, we start to lose our taste buds, and so older people often have higher taste thresholds. Many times you might hear the comment, oh, the food tastes the same, or right? it doesn't taste as good as it used to be. And that oftentimes might be due to the loss of taste buds as we get older. In contrast, children have a lot of taste buds. They're young, they, they haven't de declined with age, and so oftentimes children tolerate sp spices poorly because their taste buds are very, very sensitive to everything. Yeah? How do you reduce the reduction in uh, taste buds? How do you lose it? How do you maintain it? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if it's possible uh, or whether it's just something that uh, kind of declines with, with age. I'm sure there are individual differences with respect to that too, and that would be interesting to kind of take a look at. That's a good question. Um, in the olfactory system, um, smell is an olfactory system response to airborne chemicals. Actually, anything that we smell is a chemical in the air that has, has contacted our olfactory receptors. There are about a thousand different olfactory receptors, each having its own special receptor protein. And there appears to be no organization of these receptors uh, at the level of the olfactory mucosa where the receptors are located. Um, and uh, all receptors having the same receptor protein though seem to project to the same area of olfactory cortex. So we have retinotopic mapping in the visual system, tonotopic mapping in the um, auditory system, and in ol the olfactory system, we have ototopic mapping. The receptors for olfaction are located in the olfactory epithelium, which is located in the nasal cavity, and the surface is composed of three different cell types. There are the receptor cells themselves that contact the chemical uh, in the air, the supporting cells around the receptor cells, and then basal cells. And the, in order to perceive an odor, that odor has to pass through a layer of mucus to actually reach the receptors. The receptors are sort of bathed in mucus that, uh, that protects them from drying out and uh, keeps them alive and hydrated. Um, the axons of the receptor cells then um, leave that uh, olfactory epithelium and start to form the olfactory tract. The transduction of olfactory stimuli going from the chemical um, in the air to the actual uh, uh, neural stimulus, uh, that transduction occurs in the olfactory receptors located in the olfactory mucosa. Uh, projections to various parts of the limbic system uh, are seen. So uh, these uh, receptors project into the limbic system, and that's um, responsible for the emotional perception of odorants. Certain um, odors will have uh, some, uh, oftentimes, an emotional component associated with them. Uh, the scent of, uh, you know, of, of something very pleasant, uh, the scent of a baby, for example, and uh, again, is sort of the whole range of emotional uh, types of uh, content associated with various smells. There's also uh, projections to the dorsomedial nucleus of the thalamus. We'll see that the dorsomedial nucleus of the thalamus plays a major role in memory. And so uh, oftentimes uh, scent can evoke a particular memory and maybe through that pathway that scents are able to acquire their potential for evoking memory. And uh, the dorsomedial nucleus of the thalamus then passes on the olfactory information to the orbitofrontal cortex, um, and so in the frontal lobe where the odor is consciously perceived. 
The axons of the olfactory receptor cells um, actually then synapse in the olfactory bulb or cranial nerve one. When we talked about the 12 cranial nerves, the olfactory nerve was the, the first cranial nerve, and that's responsible for um, our smell. It's made up of a number of layers. The fibers pass from the olfactory bulb to the piriform cortex, and then from the piriform cortex, we have one pathway that goes to the central part of the dorsomedial nucleus of the thalamus and onto the orbital frontal cortex, like I just mentioned. And the second pathway goes from the piriform cortex to the lateral hypothalamus and to the orbital frontal cortex. So it's another alternative pathway to get to the orbital frontal cortex. And I just, I have no explanation for why these pathways aren't showing up. The gustatory system um, uh, operates in tandem with uh, smell, and the gustatory receptors are called taste buds. Um, we have actually, we, we used to think we only had four senses. Uh, I remember growing up, we only had four senses, and amazingly, we have the fifth sense. Uh, uh, or a taste sense, uh, it's called umami or glutamate. It's that savory type of uh, flavor. They're actually receptors for umami uh, in addition to sweet, sour, bitter, and salty. But uh, these uh, perceptions don't match up nicely with four simple or five simple gustatory receptors. Um, many flavors that we can experience can't seem to be recreated by combinations of these pr primary flavors. Raises a question of whether there might be other receptors that we haven't discovered yet that uh, might be responsible for those alternative um, uh, flavors or whether there's some other explanation for that. Some flavors seem to activate taste neurons by altering the um, neural activity uh, by changing the activity of ion channels rather than directly through receptors themselves. So by actually modulating uh, an ion channel itself, uh, for example, the salt uh, 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 sense uh, could um, affect a chloride channel. Uh, by changing the activity of those, um, uh, those ion channels, it could result in a different perception of that uh, taste. So gustation, or taste, is related to eating foods and drinking liquids, and molecules in the food uh, dissolve in the saliva of the mouth, and uh, then they activate, uh, contact and activate one of the five receptor types. Interestingly, each receptor type provides some information about a food, and that suggests um, some sort of evolutionary or biological significance or importance to our ability to taste um, different, uh, uh, have different uh, sensitivity to different tastes. Um, so a sweet sensation is associated with foods that are more or less safe. Salty uh, was important for us to be able to detect a source of sodium ions um, and uh, making sure that we have an adequate sodium intake is important for the body's functioning. The bitter taste helps us detect uh, alkaline substances or even poisonous foods. Bless you. The sour taste allows us to detect spoiled foods. And the um, umami or glutamate um, taste um, is associated with our ability to taste protein, which is important also in normal um, uh, food intake. Interestingly, flavor, the flavor associated with any type of food or drink is uh, in a mixture of both taste and olfaction. Uh, people who have difficulty with taste will also oftentimes report difficulty with smell and vice versa. So the, in terms of the transduction in the gustatory system, the taste molecules uh, bind with the receptor. They alter membrane potentials of those receptors, and uh, they induce receptor potentials. Saltiness, the best stimulus is sodium chloride, and the receptor for saltiness, as I mentioned, might be a simple uh, sodium channel. And uh, 
activity in the sodium channel changes in the presence of salt. Sourness receptors seem to respond to hydrogen ions present in acid solutions. So any type of acid, like vinegar, for example, has that sour taste, or citric acid um, uh, in a lemon. Uh, bitterness, the typical stimulus is an alkaloid, like quinine. And here, receptors involve some sort of hydrophobic uh, residue. And sweetness, the typical stimulus is a sugar. And uh, the sweetness receptors may have, uh, or seem to have a hydrogen ion site. So by, again, changing the uh, permeability to uh, the hydrogen ion, uh, that could affect or allow us to taste the sweet taste of something. The gustatory information is transmitted through cranial nerve 7, uh, 9, and 10. So it's innervating the anterior tongue, the posterior tongue, and then the more the back of the throat, the palate and the epiglottis. Uh, yeah, Prince? Yeah, I would like to know whether it has the ability to change the taste from one, like from the bitter to sweet. Because there are some, 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 is it a wave or something? If you change the stress, it's, it's really bitter. Uh -huh. But uh, in a short period, you start feeling the sweet after all. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's an interesting question, um, and I wonder if maybe the compact, what is it, what for you? A leaf, uh, a leaf, and a leaf? You taste it, yeah, if you put it in your mouth and crush it, it's very bitter, mm -hmm. but is it a short, like, two or five seconds, you start feeling the sweet after all this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder if that might be due to the saliva breaking down or changing the chemical structure of the chemical in the leaf that might be responsible for that. But uh, that's that's interesting phenomenon I hadn't thought about. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the uh, the gustatory uh, pathway. The, uh, that information, as I mentioned, is transmitted first through uh, three different cranial nerves, and then there's the one relay station in the taste pathway that is the nucleus of the solitary tract and the medulla. Uh, so it's more in the brain stem first, and that taste information is transmitted to the primary gustatory cortex um, in the telencephalon, uh, as well as to the amygdala and to the hypothalamus. Uh, the taste information, again, is, uh, uh, seems to be associated with the amygdala for producing uh, amygdala. When we think of amygdala, we often think of fear. And when we talk about emotion, we'll be talking a lot about the amygdala. And uh, so fear uh, is important. Uh, it helps us to uh, taste. If we taste something that's bad for us, we then try to have to remember not to taste that again. So we try, it helps us to avoid that compound in the future. Um, the hypothalamus is very important in feeding behavior. When we talk about ingestive behavior, we'll see that the, um, the hypothalamus is one of the major players involved in, uh, in feeding. So uh, it makes sense to have that taste information transmitted to the hypothalamus so the hy hypothalamus can do its thing in terms of releasing various hormones to um, regulate our eating behavior. Recordings from the uh, corda tympani or the se seventh cranial nerve uh, indicate that um, taste fibers respond to more than one taste quality as well as to temperature. And so um, in the cortex, <coughs> one study found that the major groups of taste sensitive neurons were actually salty and sweet, which uh, uh, kind of makes sense. Um, the bitter and the um, uh, sour may have evolved a little bit later on. So the, in the pathways, again, we have these three cranial nerves that carry information from the tongue, uh, 7, 9, and 10. All three nerves enter the nucleus of the solitary tract uh, in the medulla, which forms the main gustatory nerve. One route goes to the ventral posterior and medial nucleus of the thalamus, and then on to an, uh, an area, a taste area in the insula. Um, in the frontal cortex, and uh, also to a secondary taste area 
There's another route that goes from the solitary tract uh, to the pontine taste nucleus to the lateral hypothalamus and amygdala. So again, uh, though that pathway, as I alluded to before, may affect the hormonal control of eating. Once again, my taste pathways are not showing up. I'll again circulate those like I did uh, today through an announcement. Hopefully that came through all right. Okay, so moving on to the somatosensory system. Um, now the visual and auditory systems we call um, exteroceptive systems because they're sensitive to incoming information from the external environment. And the somatosensory system also is sensitive to um, the external environment, of course, and so it serves, therefore, an exteroceptive function. In addition, the um, somatosensory system is proprioceptive, and that means it tells us about our relative position of our bodies in space, and um, our uh, relative position of body segments relative to one another. So that's what we mean by proprioception. So in addition to being exteroceptive, it's proprioceptive, and it's also interoceptive. So it's very sensitive to recording internal body events as well, such as blood pressure. So uh, the somatosensory system is really uh, very uh, incredible in terms of its ability to be sensitive to things from the outside, things on the inside, and then uh, our relative position of our body and space. The somatosenses themselves provide information related to events on the skin as well as to um, events occurring inside the body. And the cutaneous senses receive signals from the skin in the form of touch, or the sense of touch. And when we talk about touch, we can uh, talk about sensitivity to pressure, and pressure changes, vibration, uh, temperature, heating, cooling of the skin, as well as stimulate the damaged tissue and produce pain. Kinesthesia provides information about body position and movement, and uh, we actually have kinesthetic uh, signals that arise from receptors that are located within each of our joints, and that, uh, as well as the tendons and the muscles uh, that uh, kind of signal to the brain that the body's moving. And then we have organic sense, uh, senses that uh, provide information about the status of internal organs and changes in blood pressure and things of that nature. And there are at least 20 different types of somatosensory receptors. Um, each of those transduce a different form of energy from pressure to vibration to temperature, things like that. Um, and uh, the receptor surface of the somatosensory system is larger than any of the other sensory systems, obviously, because there's receptors in all body tissues, except, amazingly, the brain itself. The brain has no um, somatosensory receptors. The basic organization of our receptors um, in the somatosensory system is the same as in vi the visual and auditory system, for example because the membrane potential of each receptor is altered by a particular form of energy. Uh, in this case, um, thermal uh, for temperature or um, mechanical type of energy for uh, touch. Uh, and uh, each of these receptors in the somatosensory system also has its own receptive field. It responds to a particular part of the body. It's an area of the body tissue, the receptive field for each receptor. So uh, in the spinal cord, um, this is a diagram of the spinal cord, and uh, it's important to point out the, uh, the gray matter uh, is located uh, in the sort of internal part here. Uh, it forms like a, it looks like a butterfly. That's the gray matter. It contains neuronal cell bodies and synapses, just like the gray matter of the brain. Uh, but instead of being on the outside, like in the brain, in the spinal cord, the gray matter is on the inside. And it's surrounded by white matter, which contain the ascending and descending fiber pathways 
you're sending fiber pathways, bringing the sensory information to the brain, the descending fiber pathways, um, carrying the, out the, uh, the efferent or the motor um, uh, pathways to execute movements. And uh, here we have uh, certain tracts within the spinal cord and uh, the spinal thalamic tract, as we'll see, is sensitive to, um, it's, the, it's the tract that carries uh, pain and temperature information to the brain. And the spinocerebellar tract carries proprioceptive information to the brain. And uh, we have these two things that are called the fasciculus gracilis and the fasciculus cuneatus. We just call those the posterior columns um, or the um, dorsal columns. And those are uh, uh, responsible for um, the information related to uh, fine touch, pressure, and precisely localized kinesthesia. Um, so uh, these, uh, these are the dorsal uh, columns here, or posterior columns, and uh, they carry the information incoming from a particular sensory receptor up the spinal cord, then uh, to the thalamus, and then to Brodmann area 3B and 1. We saw Brodmann area 1, 2, and 3. Uh, those were the primary somatosensory cortex. The area is a gyrus just behind the central fissure of the brain. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, again, where kinesthetic and somatosensory information is first processed, the primary somatosensory cortex. And uh, Brodmann area three has actually been divided into 3A and 3B, but the same general region. I mentioned the spinal thalamic tract, we call those the lateral columns because they're more on the side of the, um, of the spinal cord. That carries pain and temperature signals. And with pain and temperature, it's poorly localized. If we feel something hot uh, or cold on our skin, for example, it's oftentimes very hard to locate the source of that um, exactly. Uh, alternatively, if we feel kind of an itch uh, or there's uh, you know, some sort of uh, uh, something, uh, uh, part of clothing that's touching us, we can localize where that, uh, that, that sensation is coming from more precisely. Um, the spinal thalamic tract in any event during pain and temperature signals projects to the dorsal part of the ventrobasal thalamus and then on to primary somatosensory cortex. And it also sends pathways uh, to the lateral posterior thalamus and then on to Brodmann area five uh, Brodmann area 5 is also known as secondary somatosensory cortex. Just kind of in the same realm as uh, Luria's organization of the brain, we have the primary sensory cortex that processes the incoming information from the thalamus, and then we have the secondary um, or association cortex that does more of the higher order sensory processing or multimodal processing of information. So the somatosensory cortex itself uh, in the parietal lobe is organized into distinct columns and uh, there might be five or 10 different cortical maps of the body surface uh, within the parietal cortex. Finally, a good uh, pathway came out here. So uh, this is uh, showing you the uh, pain and temperature pathway via the lateral columns going to the ventral basal uh, pulvinar nucleus of the thalamus and lateral posterior thalamus. So these are all nuclei within the thalamus and they project onto primary uh, somatosensory cortex, Brodmann area one, two, and three, as well as uh, secondary cortex um, five and uh, uh, S2. The dorsal columns uh, that carry fine touch, pressure, and kinesthesis information um, go up uh, through, uh, again, the funiculus uh, uh, gracilis and the funiculus cuneatus uh, to the ventral basal thalamus to primary 
somatosensory cortex, and then onto secondary somatosensory cortex, and then onto the highest order of processing tertiary. So uh, these are two uh, independent systems within the somatosensory pathway. Um, if we have large lesions uh, to the parietal cortex, for example, a brain tumor, a stroke, uh, uh, significant trauma, things of that nature, um, those lesions to the parietal cortex could produce what's known as a somatosensory agnosia. Um, two types of somatosensory agnosias include astereognosis, or the loss of the ability to recognize objects by touch in the absence of um, uh, any defects in somatosensation. And uh, to test this, what we do is uh, we actually put an object in the individual's hand outside of their visual, uh, outside of their sight, and we ask them to identify what that object is. Um, the standardized test that we have has little <coughs> plastic uh, objects. There's a star, a triangle, a circle, a square. So those are very nameable types of objects that are, are very handy. But they, you know, like any test, uh, you know, psychological test, they cost a bunch of money. So if you want to test on, on, the, well, on the cheap, you, you can also use a little bit of money, but you can have people try to identify the differences between uh, coins but uh, outside this, their site. That would be a sort of a quick and easy test of stereognosis to see how well somebody can identify what the coin is that you place in their hand. Um, or uh, you can also um, you know, up the game a little bit and put things like a paper clip or a, a pencil or you know, things of that nature into a hand to see if the person can identify that object just by touch without looking at it. Um, the uh, asomatognosia is a loss of the ability to recognize parts of one's own body. And a, a common test that we use for this one is called a finger agnosia test. And uh, in this type of test, we um, have, again, the hand, uh, the, individual's hand is outside their vision, and then we ask them to identify the finger that we touch um, without looking at it. And so we'll just lightly touch a finger. We never touch one right next to the other. We always try to skip a finger to make it a little bit harder. And the inability to identify the, the finger that's touched um, is associated with what's called finger agnosia. And we'll, we'll talk about some uh, other syndromes that um, are associated with finger agnosia. Stroke is a particularly common one where somebody might have finger agnosia following a stroke. The, uh, we haven't uh, really talked too much about the sensory and the motor homunculus, but I presume that you probably talked about this in brain and behavior. But as you know, um, along the primary motor strip and the primary somatosensory cortex, just anterior to and posterior to the central fissure, um, we have um, the, 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 this strip of cortex is sort of organized uh, uh, with respect to uh, a particular part of the body. And uh, certain uh, in the somatosensory homunculus, or little man, we can see that uh, certain body parts uh, have a lot of cortex devoted to them, notably the fingers uh, and the hands, and uh, relatively less uh, associated with uh, the, the leg, for example, and uh, quite a bit of cortex devoted to the face, sen sensation of the face. And uh, also, same on the motor side, uh, we see that there's a lot of motor functioning uh, input from the cortex in the, uh, in the face area. Um, the leg seems to have uh, quite a large representation, uh, not as much sensory in input, though. But uh, I think it's kind of interesting to, and important to keep in mind um, the 
more uh, ventral portions of the brain are associated with um, more toward the top of the body, uh, oftentimes, and uh, the, as you kind of curve around uh, into the um, uh, between the two hemispheres, uh, you have more of the, the lower parts of the body. So this is a very simple diagram of um, the pathways, uh, the two uh, major somatosensory pathways that we talked about, uh, as well as a third, the spinocerebellar tract. The uh, spinal thalamic uh, tract associated with pain and temperature um, uh, is uh, depicted here. And what's interesting is that the fibers cross over uh, uh, very low in the spinal cord, and then they ascend up on the uh, contralateral side of the, where the stimulus occurred. For uh, proprioception, stereognosis, uh, light touch, for example, we have the posterior columns uh, that we uh, talked about, uh, and uh, that actually goes up the spinal cord along the same side of the, where the stimulus was and it crosses at the point between where the spinal cord meets the medulla. Uh, crosses over there much higher and then uh, goes on to the, <coughs> the brain. And uh, over here we have um, the unconscious proprioception that's mediated by the spinal cerebellar tract. That actually doesn't cross over, that stays on the same side. So if there is a deficit in um, proprioception, for example, uh, stereognosis, conscious stereognosis, conscious proprioception, or pain and temperature, we can then use this idea to try to localize where, if there's a spinal cord injury, where that spinal cord injury might be and how it might affect their uh, ability to process sensory information. So just a few words about pain. Uh, pain serves a functional role for survival, and uh, persons who lack pain are uh, really at great risk. Um, and there's a case in your a case study in your book that talks about such a person. Um, pain stimulate usually induce a species typical escape and withdrawal response, and so pain is a motivational force that can activate a particular type of behavior. Um, pain generally involves tissue destruction induced by either thermal stimuli, mechanical force, or a lack of, a blood, of blood supply. Um, pain reception is poorly localized, as is temperature, because it's mediated through the spinal thalamic tract. Um, finally, another important uh, point about pain is that it uh, involves an emotional component that can be used to magnify the magnitude of the pain reception, or pain perception. And in fact, uh, there are some interesting studies that have shown that um, uh, uh, people who are hypnotized, for example, can still feel a stimulus that's painful, but they don't have the same reaction as somebody who hasn't undergone hypnosis. Pain receptors are called nociceptors and uh, there are free nerve endings that form networks within the skin that uh, respond to intense pressure. These are high threshold mechanoreceptors that only fire on the verge of potential tissue damage. They also include free nerve endings that respond to heats, acids, capsaicin. Uh, so uh, that's why acids and hot foods can produce sort of a burning sensation. And then receptors for pain, these nociceptors also include receptors that are sensitive to ATP. Uh, pain receptors can be found in the skin, uh, in the sheath around the muscles, internal organs, cornea of the eye, the pulp of the teeth. Uh, pain receptors are activated again by uh, mechanical, thermal, and chemical stimulation. There are three per perceptual components of pain, uh, also important to kind of understand. As, uh, oftentimes, as neuropsychologists, we're asked to try to treat uh, individuals for, um, uh, for pain or chronic pain. Uh, one perceptual component is the sensory component of pain. 
Um, this is mediated by a pathway that goes from the spinal cord to the ventral posterior lateral thalamus and then on to the primary and secondary somatosensory cortex. So that's just really basically involved in the pure perception um, of the painful stimulus. And associated with that stimulus oftentimes is the immediate emotional consequences of pain or the unpleasantness or bothersome quality of pain. Um, here, uh, these, this is mediated by a different set of pathways that reach uh, anterior cingulate cortex and insular cortex. And then there's the long-term emotional consequences of chronic pain. It's more of a threat to well-being or future comfort. Uh, so people who are experiencing chronic pain uh, have uh, significant uh, difficulties with these long-term emotional consequences. Those, um, that perceptual component is mediated by pathways that reach the prefrontal cortex. So this diagram really shows the three perceptual pathways. Um, we have the nociceptive information or pain information coming in from the spinal cord. Uh, that goes into the dorsal medial and ventral posterior lateral thalamic nuclei. Um, and uh, the uh, ventral posterior thalamic nucleus sends information on primary somatosensory cortex and secondary somatosensory cortex for the uh, more of the sensory uh, component of pain. Um, this pathway from the dorsal medial thalamic nucleus to anterior cingulate and prefrontal cortex um, uh, associated more with unpleasantness, uh, the unpleasantness dimension, uh, and the activation of the prefrontal cortex long term is associated with those long term emotional implications of pain. These are two um, very similar types of um, imaging studies that were described in your textbook. Um, one study by Rainville and colleagues in 1997 was the one where um, uh, they uh, had individuals who uh, put their arms in an uh, ice water bath. And if you've ever done that, uh, it actually can be extremely painful. Uh, institutional review boards allow that type of research to go on because it rarely results in any kind of um, physical harm or long-term physical harm, even though it's very, very unpleasant. Um, but uh, as you can see, there's uh, activity in the uh, primary somatosensory cortex. So the, the incoming information is saying, hey, there's some pain going on here. And then there's uh, activation of the anterior cingulate uh, cortex, which is associated with the unpleasantness or bothersome quality of pain. That is, oh, this is really irritating. I hate this. Um, it's not chronic pain, so we don't see as much of the prefrontal cortex activated. Uh, this is an image of individuals who were hypnotized to not be um, bothered by the pain. They were hypnotized to say, "Oh, you'll feel you'll feel this sensation, but you won't be bothered by it." And uh, it, amazingly, uh, they didn't show that activity in the anterior cingulate cortex like the first group, but they still show activation of the somatosensory cortex, suggesting that they're, they're feeling something, but they're just not bothered by it. So very, very interesting. And uh, Hoffbauer and colleagues did the opposite. They actually showed the opposite finding. They hypnotized people to feel more pain. Um, and uh, they... Uh, were able to make the uh, anterior cingulate light up uh, in the presence of, um, of a relatively um, innocuous stimulus. So uh, kind of two ends of the same spectrum, uh, two very interesting functional imaging studies. Thomas? Uh, how long does it take for chronic pain to make its like the frontal cortex? Oh, that's a good question. I think um, as these, uh, these uh, first two perceptual components are active for um, you know, a period of time, um, uh, I think uh, uh, chronically that can lead to uh, another arousal of the, or additional arousal of the prefrontal cortex as people start to kind of look toward the future and say, oh, well, when is this pain going to go away? Um, so I think, I don't know if they have 
tie to a specific time frame, but I would say that with repetitive activation uh, of, uh, you know, of a painful stimulus, that uh, those prefrontal circuits would start to engage. Um, I would imagine it probably wouldn't take too, too long, maybe a week or so, but I'm just sort of speculating. All right, um, so we're going to turn to motor functioning. 